If you're tuning in right now, you probably have seen one of my NFL videos before, and somebody that I've mentioned in those is John. Well, we got the infamous John right here who helped me get the NFL job, and we shoot the Bears games every single home game together. He does video, I do photo, can we, so we can kind of talk both ends of the whole job. So let's talk about how in the first place did you even build your work up enough to getting it to a point where you can apply for an NFL job and actually have them bat an eye at it. Yeah, I think I think the first step is I think there's two two parts to getting a job with the NFL or any big sports organization that you want to work with. And the first thing is networking, like we've both talked about, who you know, referrals, people with inside the program, people who can recommend you or say something about you, and then two, you're real in your portfolio. So in my case, I had met Tay Bates literally at a Nike event seven years ago and saw that he was in the program. And then when I applied, I was like, hey, I know these people, and here's my reel in my portfolio. And then once I got that in there, it was enough for them to say, hey, we want to do a phone interview and then go through the process to get me hired. Um, but I think those are the two two big things. What would you say? Um, I definitely would say I have some kind of portfolio for what you're shooting. Now, when I say that, if you want the NFL job, you don't need to have a football portfolio. You need to have a sports portfolio. Yep. I didn't have any any football portfolio before this, but I could show basketball photos. I could show other sports so they know, okay, I know the sports world a little bit. And to get to a point of actually – having a chance of getting the job. I tell people this all the time. The biggest cheat code is meeting other photographers. I know a lot of photographers who it's not a competition. Like, I'm not competing with you. I'm not competing with other people. But if I know you and you need help on a gig and we get along, you're going to call me like our story right here. Yeah. Very short I can tell it very short, yeah. but I fired off a DM to you saying something along the lines of, <laughs> I can do anything you need me to do. I just want to help out. Guys, and granted, jo Joey was a <laughs> freshman in college at this point. So I get a DM. I'm in Chicago. Like I'm building my media agency. I'm like, who is this guy? I can literally do any, any video or anything you want. I'm like, all right, whatever. Cool. Come to a shoot. And then boom, we were on a shoot together. Yeah. And so we were on a shoot. Funny thing about that shoot. It just went terribly. Crashed. Crash drone formatted cards and we couldn't even get access to what we needed yeah. to shoot. It was just a terrible The client wasn't there. It was a total mess. Total <laughs> it was a total mess. mess. We ended up getting dinner, which was probably more beneficial yeah. for our relationship down the road. But we met there and then you consistently would either either get a job offer that was a low budget or no budget at all. But you knew that I needed to build my portfolio. So you'd get a DM for a $100 gig for some random event. And you'd give it to me and I would take it. And that's how I slowly built up my portfolio. And that was huge for me because I didn't have people coming in my DMs or reaching out to my email because I didn't really know anybody. And I didn't have much to show. I didn't have a great network. And meeting a photographer, meeting photographers that were successful already in the industry was huge for me, which then ended up with you connecting me for the NFL job. So my number one piece of advice to people that are starting out is meet as many photographers as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Because the ones that you meet that you want to be friends with and that you really will enjoy being around are the ones that aren't going to treat it as a competition. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's, it's really cliche always in the creative industry to say, oh, build your network, network with people, network with people. It's such a buzzword. You're like, okay, how do I network? What do I do? A, you have to have like good people and social skills and be in a room and be in a setting where you can network or B, you need to reach out to emails or LinkedIn and stuff. And I think that's where a lot of people don't think about it, where from a business mind, that's exactly where I go. I'm like, hey, I want to work with Nike Chicago or Red Bull. How am I going to get in touch with someone? I don't know anyone there. Joey doesn't know anyone there. All my 20, 30 creative friends don't know anybody there. Okay, I'm going to pop on LinkedIn Sales Navigator and go and find the head of content for Red Bull Chicago, grab their email, and shoot them a cold email and reach out to them. And then that's where most people stop is they send one email. Oh, man, yeah, they didn't respond. Major bummer. I tried to get Red Bull. Well, most people stop after one. Send a second email. If they don't answer that one, give them a phone call. Yeah. 
And that's where you can really separate yourself and build great relationships with big companies and big clients. If you're a freelancer, you only need one, two, or three good partnerships to make a living. Whether you want to develop it into a business or an agency is a different story. But I think that's a lot of the missing pieces. People don't dive deep enough on the networking side of it, where you you can get a hold of a lot of people in this world through social media nowadays. You can find emails, phone numbers, all that kind of things with great sales tools that are out there. And that's what we do a lot at indoor drone tours and what I've done over the years. So that's one thing I would say, because I think network is such like a big buzzword in a sense. Uh, yeah. You're and then right. when you're in those rooms, like we talk about at events, take advantage of them. Go up. Hey, what's your Instagram? I'm Joey. I'm from Chicago. Here's what I like to shoot. Here's my passions. Boom, boom, boom. And you vibe with people. And those are just your in-person social skills. Yeah. So. And I mean, harping back on the following up thing is it took me four or five times following up with the NFL people to actually get it after your recommendation, after filling out the application, just following up, following up mm -hmm. and hitting the inbox at the right time. And Whenever you go up and talk to people at those events, a piece of advice that I would have is to kind of be weary of who you are talking to. And by that, I mean, if you're there with an agency, don't go up to the client, introduce yourself as an individual. Because Correct. if you're there for an agency, that's not your client. Your client is the agency that's hiring you. Yep. You have no right and you can get yourself in trouble and really get yourself on a bad list of that agency. If you go up and try stealing a client, that's one of the worst things that you can do. Yes. In the moment it might seem cool. Oh, I'm hanging out with these Nike reps. Let me give them my contact information. So this can be my job, but you're just going to make yourself look bad yeah. and you're just going to break relationships and you're going to get blacklisted by people because I'll talk to you about it then. Yeah. And then you'll talk to somebody else about it. And then next thing you know, people yeah. don't want to work with they're you gonna anymore. say oh my gosh joey did that we can't hire that kid but i think i mean that goes to just i think like being a good person having good social skills and at the end of the day i think there's there's room for healthy competition of oh why didn't i win that gig or oh they got this request for a proposal and i didn't i want to be the agency producing that but at the end of the day there's so much space in the content game for people and the content industry is only growing faster and faster every year more companies need content more brands are being built every day and there's more content being consumed every day so the competition factor isn't a huge thing for me i like to look at it in a healthy way of like hey i want to be better than this company or produce something more creative and cooler than that company not in a sense of like oh my gosh they stole my business or there's not enough business out there for me if you're going to sit there and sulk over that stuff like you need to find a different motivation or, yeah. or a, a different driver. So that's another thing I'd say kind of on the and with the big brands industry that, side of things. The big brands that everybody wants to work with, they people don't realize that they have a lot of different creatives and agencies that they work with. Yeah. You know, this the same creative doesn't shoot all of Nike's content. There are hundreds of people yeah. that shoot for these big companies. So that does you you don't have to feel like you're competing with these people that might get called instead of you and yeah. then whenever it comes to actually moving up and and so you got the job and you want to not stay stagnant with these with these clients you want to always be leveling up you know, you might be upgrading your gear, but frankly, the client doesn't care about that. Yeah. The video can look great with any camera. If, yeah. if you make a good product, they couldn't care less. How do you keep the client excited after you have been there for a year, been there for two years, and you like the job, but maybe they're getting bored of it? Yeah. I'd say just coming up with new ideas and bringing new ideas to the table with clients is a big thing, especially if you're a freelancer or business and have had this client for a year or two years, they don't want to see their content get stale because that's when someone could steal that client because, you know, another business or freelancer comes in and say, Hey, I've got this amazing idea for an FPV drone or a hyperlapse or whatever it is, is staying fresh with your content and fresh with your ideas. So something at indoor drone tours we do that I think is really important is we do a year end review with our clients where we take some of our clients and we say, hey, what worked well this year? What worked bad this year? Or what do you want us to improve on as a company? And what did we excel in? And then they're allowed to kind of open it honestly, being like, hey, the turnaround time on this one video wasn't ideal. We told you it was really tight. Say, so, hey, that's on us. We'll own it. We'll get better at that. That's why we're hiring more editors and more account managers and things. So I think like a year-end review with clients is big. And I think just like open communication lines with them. If they can tell you what they like, what they don't like, and that kind of stuff, that's huge too. So 
Yeah, new ideas is always. Yeah, big going thing. back into sports. Yeah, where sports is one of, is the kind of world that everybody wants to do. Everybody that is a sports fan thinks it's the coolest thing in the world to yeah. be a sports photographer. But I know one thing that I've noticed is the sports world's pay is not as good as mm-hmm. some of the other more boring kind of jobs, right. the corporate jobs. Yeah. And by corporate, I don't mean a corporate nine to five. I'm talking like a construction video. A, sure. And so how, how do you recommend somebody to get into the sports world, but not only – how am I trying to say it? There, there's not going to be that much money right away. So to find that balance initially, but still have the goal of being in the sports world. Yeah. I, th- I think it's tough and you got to pick or choose your options, but – in the sports world specifically, everyone wants to do it. So it's a classic like supply and demand issue. It's like if we stop working for the NFL, they're going to find other people that are going to go fill our spots as, as bad as that sounds. But it's like because everyone wants to be in the sports world, they can have less money. It doesn't mean that it's right, but that's why when you see all these college athletic departments hiring for a new video producer, a new creative director, a new graphic designer, and they put out their starting salaries at forty five, fifty thousand dollars 50000 and they're like, everyone roasts them on Twitter. Cause like, Oh, creatives are worth so much more, but everyone wants a job at university of Texas and someone's going to take it to yeah. get their foot in the door and get started. And then even a lot of the people I know in the sports industry, they eventually go freelance or start their own agency. Cause that's where the bigger budgets and bigger money is, is as they grow and develop their skills too. So it's not really a great answer, but it's just a little bit of the landscape and how it works. Yeah, unfortunately. How it works. I mean- so it's interesting it because I, I do you do see that there's a pretty high turnover in a lot of the different sports jobs where you might know the creative director of a team sporting program right now, but in a year it's like oh somebody yeah. news there they moved on and people are all trying to build their portfolio, which is exactly what a lot of young creators yeah. are trying to do. And let's dive into portfolios and reels. Yeah, and and so to build a portfolio as much as it stinks is you, you got to do things for free Yeah, and you want to make money right away. You want to make multiple thousand dollars per shoot, but whenever you're, whenever you're building it, you, you have to kind of swallow your ego and realize that, okay, I'm going to take the next year to really build it up. And I'm not saying don't take a paying job the entire year. You can still take all the paying jobs, but you just probably won't have that many opportunities. But to actually level up, you you need to have that portfolio. Yeah. I think what we talked about earlier is like how do you get these big jobs with sports companies and with big brands? It's your network and having an awesome portfolio and or real. So I think those are like the two big things mm-hmm. that kind of get you into the bigger gigs and bigger companies. Um, and I think in the portfolio aspect of things, people spend so much time on their real and their showpiece but you really just need one great piece of content that shows I can edit, I can shoot, I can do this, I can do that. If you're trying to be a motion designer, you need a reel that's heavy in After Effects and Cinema 4D and Blender to show those skills. If you just want to be an editor, it doesn't matter what footage you're using, just make an awesome edit. If you're trying to be your run and gun and do it all like you and I do when we're out producing content, you got to be able to show the live turnarounds, the video, the photo, all those different skills, kind of Swiss Army Knife creative style. So... It's building your portfolio to like what you're trying to get into yeah. and, and what your goal is as a creative. But I could go on on portfolios. Yeah, and, and I think all the time. there there is the line too between yeah, it's good to have a good reel, but if you have a nice reel that makes every shot's beautiful, but then you're trying to get storytelling pieces, you need to have a piece of content that shows that you can tell a story. Mm-hmm. I think reels. People harp on them way too much and they don't actually have a project to show. Nobody's going to hire you to make a reel. They're going to hire you to work on a specific kind of project. And one, we go back to the outreach, which is what we talked about. And we've had this conversation personally in the past because I've slowly grown in the industry. Spec work. Spec work is something that... uh, I'll let you speak on it. I don't but think I don't know if I've ever produced a piece of spec work. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, have you? I don't think I don't know if many people have really gotten <laughs> jobs off of spec work. It doesn't make sense to me. It makes it makes zero sense to me. I I'm part of the crew that's like, yes, there is a time and a place for free work 
when the opportunity is right, when the relationship is right, when there's potential opportunity for a lot of business and revenue from that client or that person. But in terms of getting paid of, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a spec ad for LaCroix and do that. You could do one or two if you wanted to, but you better be using that piece as, hey, I'm going to be a product videographer or a product photographer. So unless you're using it for a niche, most people do it to just make a cool piece where I would argue, you say, why don't you go make a cool piece for the local restaurant in the floor of this building, charge them $100, $200. So you get something and there's some value exchange going on, right? You get paid for this deliverable and this piece of work and you can spend as much time making that restaurant video, the coolest 30 second ad ever sound effects, everything you need to make that restaurant video amazing. You got paid for it, and then you can take it to the next restaurant or next company. And people know what good video editing and good production looks like. So even if it's you know a local restaurant that's not a big brand name like McDonald's, well, if you can show that to another food company, they're not going to care that it's the local restaurant down the street and not McDonald's. They're going to say, oh, this edit is incredible, and your creative work is unbelievable. Let's hire him for $1,000 this time. So I just think like the value exchange is huge. I think people give away like free work too much. And even like when we bring people on shoots or like train people, like I always want them to get paid for their time and their effort if they're going to be there. Like I just think that's how you should be in the creative industry. So that's my view on spec work. Like I get it, and but I think it's way more of a passion project than an actual like business fold to go after. Of Like I'm going to make this ad for Red Bull and then I'm going to take this Red Bull spec ad and pitch it to – coke or pepsi or whoever it's like yeah you whenever you make spec ads typically whenever you have that kind of mindset of oh i'm gonna i i have this Lacroix sitting next to me oh i i own a jeep yeah if you make a jeep ad the odds of that actually getting into the eyes of jeep to have them hire you are just so slim mm-hmm. and a piece of advice that i know you gave me before is instead of taking the time to do the spec ad, the spec ad Use that to reach out to people. Use that to find somebody's contact, send a DM. That's so much more valuable because at the end of the day, you producing a spec ad, just a post for one Instagram, TikTok post, is it going to move the needle? Yeah, there's a chance of it going viral, but what can move the needle more is you DMing 25 different photographers that are local, meeting one of those that maybe they'll just change your life. Yeah, well, I completely agree with you. I think like input and output from the creative side is really hard. And it goes back to discipline like we talked about earlier. Us being creatives, most creatives in the industry don't love the sales process and business process. I'm super lucky to have Zach who knows it, and I'm knowledgeable from working corporate on it. But being disciplined to say, hey, I'm going to send 10 to 20 cold emails a day or cold LinkedIn messages or Instagram DMs to network and get opportunities with these people. Most people do it for two days and then stop. And then they'll go work on their website or their spec ad or their reel because that's easier and that's creative. And that's what creatives love to do. But if you really want to move the needle as a freelancer or as a business, keep that output going and you're going to see the dollars come in through the input. So it's like, If you're not putting it out there and filling up your funnel, nothing's coming back into the business. So it's like, it can be as simple, like you said, as Instagram DMs or cold emails. And there's so many ways to get knowledge. You don't have to have some crazy sales funnel, but just stay disciplined and do a little bit every day and you'll see the results. And if you don't, well, dive deeper into the sales process. Maybe you don't have a good offer. Maybe your email is not right. Maybe your language isn't right. Maybe you need to restructure your email or the text you're sending people. So I think that stuff like isn't the sexy side of business, but it gets me fired up because like that's what leads to the numbers of yeah. growing a business. So I think that's where creatives struggle and that's where most creatives will fail. But at the end of the day, the good ones will succeed because they see the opportunity there. And if they have a good talent and a good portfolio to back it up, it's game over. Yeah. And that's where it always becomes tough for somebody to become a full-time creative as well. If before they weren't at a bunch of different places where they networked with a bunch of different people, they're just starting from the ground or starting outside of the creative industry. It is tough to make that leap into, I need to re- I need to start from the ground again. Yeah. for whatever I'm doing. Yeah. And it's super hard. It's, te- it's scary. And I, I'm just being totally raw. I'm not the kind of person that likes to do the outreach to people. No one does. I like, that is so not me. I have people that will help me just like with telling me how I can do it better, but I have had to do it myself. And I tried doing 
you know, email blasts. I try, yeah. that's just not me. What works better for me is Instagram DMing. And now that I have kind of had some people reaching out to me, if somebody sends me a DM, I'm much more likely to respond to it than an email. If it's a creative asking for something. So that's one thing that I've tried to do more whenever I've been putting out content, when I've been trying to figure out what my next step is, sitting back and saying, what do I consume? What do I enjoy? And for messaging people, a DM is much more approachable for me than an email. Yeah. Whenever I sit back and think about content that I want to make, I love podcasts. So in interview style, it makes sense because if you consume it, other people are consuming it. Yep. If, if you like texts more than emails, you're not the only person there, yeah. you know? Yeah. So sitting back and thinking about how you, what you enjoy in your everyday life, that is something that's helped me a lot with realizing what the, what the step is that I need to take whenever I'm just in a terrible spot. Not yeah. knowing what I should do. Well, I think the next step on that is like something you're kind of teetering on the edge of is like if you're trying to get hired and go on tour with, you know, a music agency or an artist, whoever it is, what is that tour director consuming and how do I get in front of him? Is he someone who likes podcasts and this? And everyone's going to like their different things, mm -hmm. but I'm going to have more success for indoor drone tours, emailing people in commercial real estate because that's where they are. That's where they live. There's going to be other people that, hey, it's going to be better to pick up a phone and call because they're busy. They're not in front of a computer. Maybe they're a different type of business owner. And then you're going to have people like creatives and maybe for you who does a lot of like agency partnership work and succeeds really heavy in that lane, it's the Instagram DM. So it's like, you almost have to look at like your profile of who you're going after. And then like, how do you want to reach them? And how you as a freelancer or business owner is like your best style and plan of attack. Like everyone's little sales pitch and kind of thing is going to be different in a way. Like everyone sells in a different fashion. Some people are relationship based. Some people are numbers driven. Everyone has their own style when it comes to sales. Yeah, so I think that's huge. One of the things that I, got, I get frustrated still with whenever I'm trying to find my way is every single person, and we kind of even said this in the first interview that we did, is you need to find your niche. Find yeah. your niche. Find yeah. what you do best. Find... But that's not an easy thing to do. No, it's not It at is all. not as easy as saying, I like cars, I'm going to make car videos. That's my niche. Yeah. Because your niche ends up becoming what your jobs are at the early days. And I think that whenever you're starting out, it's take your camera to your family party and take photos at your family party. Take your camera everywhere that you go and get as much as you possibly can and you'll find your niche. Mm -hmm. And also finding your niche is finding what you like because then, oh, maybe that's where I'll push in that direction. I'm not saying if you like cars, you can't make car videos, yeah. but if you like cars, find your car photographers in Chicago, even if they're not doing anything crazy. If they're just taking pictures of their own car, maybe you hit them up and say, I want to help take pictures of your car because they might know somebody and then it all the dots can all connect.